I'm Thomas Grearty, Thomas Patrick Grearty uh, from Martinez. I was born and raised in Martinez. Can you believe that? My parents were from Martinez and my father was from Martinez and my grandparents lived there. So a long time. And then I'm in California and six generations. Wow. So my people came from Ireland. You guys know where Ireland is? Okay, and a little bit from France and a little bit from Germany, but we denied that for a long time. We said no to the Germans, you know. But anyway, I'm going to talk to you tonight about a very serious subject. And it's about life. And it's about the choice that our church has already made for us. John Paul II said, we must choose life, you know. So we, we, it has already been decided by the Holy Father and the Catechism and everything like that. But unfortunately, our country has not joined that choice. Neither has most of the countries in the world joined that choice. Somewhere along the line, after World War II, the big, most popular, most, most populous, most powerful countries got together, and they basically said there's a population problem. There's too many people. So they're really going against the Old Testament, what God said. What did God say in the Old Testament? Be fruitful and multiply. They don't believe that. They believe that we need to go the other way that we need contraception, that we need abortion, that we need all this controlled family planning, and we need self-prescribed suicide, euthanasia, all of these things. What is the goal of all of it? It's death. There needs to be more deaths. And I'm gonna read you just a, a little statistic as we get started, and we're gonna talk today about specific things that you can do in your life. Uh-oh. Okay. All right, we'll do the best we can. All right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that is around the year 2050. 2050, so that's what? 35 years from now. There's going to be a population of about 9 billion people in the world. And then after that, which has been increasing since after World War II, it's going to go down dramatically, dramatically. And why is that? Well, because the powerful nations in the world, the big money in the world, they have set forth policies to have small families, to have lots of divorce, which doesn't produce much children, to have one child per family in China. Imagine the tyranny in China of one child per family. So after the 2050, the number of population in the world is going to go down dramatically. Dramatically. Most people don't know this. They don't focus on it because they're busy with football and everything else, myself included. No, really. And we're missing the boat. So it's going to drop dramatically. And how could it not drop? If Japan has a birth rate of about 1.3 per family, that's less and less, and it goes down. And that's why they're in a perpetual recession. And China's going to go through nothing but problems with the one-child family program. In America, the United States, we rely upon immigration, people coming to our country to work and to keep our economy going. We could never sustain our economy without immigration. Thanks be to God to immigration. I don't know if any of you folks are immigrants, but thanks be to God you came to the United States if you are, and you're helping us in this country because we need it. Now, so giving that understanding of what's going on in the world with regard to population. Where does the Catholic Church stand on this? The Catholic Church is very firm. It is against suicide. Is there anybody in the room that thinks otherwise? No, I don't think so. The Catholic Church is against suicide. It's against euthanasia. The Catholic Church is not in favor of pain. So pain can be a problem when you get ill. But it is not the number one problem. The number one problem when people get old and infirm is not pain. Most of the pain is controlled with palliatives, with pain medicine. United States and, and Western countries are very good at controlling pain. But most people are concerned about the loss of dignity. They can't do the things they used to do and they were so good at. They can't do those anymore. 
okay? They're worried about being a burden for their families. Those are reasonable things, but they're not a reason for suicide. They're not a reason to take your own life. And there's two things, suicide, you, assisted suicide is you, you assist someone to commit their own death. Euthanasia is similar to that, and you help them die or you make them die. You make them die. You take a pillow and you put it over their mouth so they can't breathe. Those, that's, that's murder. That's killing. Okay, so, but this type of issue about pain is a big thing, and it is something to be concerned about. We don't want people to be suffering, okay? But this is a sensitive area, too. The church looks at this period of time when a person is old and infirm or sick, and they see it as a special opportunity of spiritual growth. I'll tell you the story of my father. My brothers and sisters and I were not having that good a communication. My father got older, and, they, and the man at the convalescent hospital came to me, and he says, I want you to sign a do not resuscitate. I said, no. He said, I want you to sign it. He goes, if your father goes into a coma, you want us to take him to the hospital? I said, absolutely. Take him to the hospital. I'm not going to sign that. Because once you sign that, they don't even call you. They, your dad's dead, right? So my dad, he went into a com coma. They took him to the hospital. And for five days, he was in the room in there. And we had religious service there. My sisters came. My brother came. We prayed together. We held hands. We laughed and everything. And then once my father passed away, we had no problems with the distribution of the estate. We had no problems with his assets. We had no problems with the service of the funeral. Everybody got along. We had a big party together. And we've been getting along ever since. And I know that it was that spiritual time that we had together with the family around the bed. Because we didn't give in. If that man would have had me sign that thing and I would have given in to him and signed it, we would never have had those special moments, okay? So this is an instance of do not resuscitate. If you don't want to be resuscitated, that's your choice, okay? That's a DNR. They call it a DNR, all right? Okay, that's fine. But you should... Another story. I'll tell you one more story. Recently, a friend of mine was quite sick and was in the hospital, and I was going to go up and see him in Oregon. And while he was there, before I got there, he had made an agreement with his wife, do not resuscitate. And they had signed an agreement, okay, both of them, and then she died. And then he's in the hospital, and the hospital got the do not resuscitate, and they put it on his wrist, okay? Does everybody understand what I'm talking about? Yes. They put it on his wrist. Mm -hmm. And he's in the hospital, and he had a heart attack. And so this fireman comes running in, and nurses are there all in the room, and the fireman jumps on the bed, jumps on top of my friend, and he's pounding his chest. And then the fireman looks at his wrist, and he says, oh, do not resuscitate. And he jumps off the bed, and he sees, do not resuscitate. And the nurse is looking, and the, the, the heart is flatlined. Does everybody know what I mean, flatlined, flatlined? And then the nurse goes, oh, his heart's back. And he starts going again. The next day, I was in to see him. So now my friend's alive. And he says, Tom, what should I do? Should I, what should I do with this do not resuscitate? I said, get rid of it. Come on. I said, we wouldn't even be talking to one another. I said, you know, get rid of it. And so he did. So this is something that you, if you don't want to be resuscitated, that's your decision. I'm not going to talk you out of that. But if you're 50, 68 years old, like he was, in pretty good health, didn't know he had a bad heart, why does he need to have that? Okay? I would argue that he shouldn't have that. Okay, that's another example. Okay, other examples are, well, let's talk about what people should have to protect yourself in situations such as this. This would be what's in your best interest, okay? You should have a will. And you should have a will that talks about your property and who gets your property and to make it clear. And who is your executor, right? Who is the person in charge of your estate? Now, a will passes property from one generation to another or from one person to other people. And it is a document that's valid after you die. Before you die, it's not valid. It's not powerful to do anything. It doesn't mean anything. It becomes effective when you die. You should have two witnesses that are unrelated to you, and it should be dated and signed. If you don't want to have any witnesses and you want to do a holographic will, you put it all in your own handwriting, you date it, 
and you sign it, all in your own handwriting, nothing on it, not in your handwriting. But I think those documents should be, should be witnessed, but the holographic will doesn't have to be. Now, besides the will, what else should you have? You should have a power of attorney for health care. A power of attorney for health care. This is a document that takes effect when you are unable to make health care decisions. When you go into the hospital, are you going to see a doctor and you're conscious and you're well and you're able to make decisions? You don't need a health care directive. But when you become incapable or incapable of making decisions, you need one. And you need to choose an attorney or a proxy to make the decisions for you. So that should be someone that you trust, and that you have confidence in, that can make those decisions and help you decide what is in your best interest. And if you appoint somebody, it should be in writing, not an oral appointment. It should be in writing, okay? And you should make that document available to that person and be in a place where you can use it. And that is an effective document, you know? You don't have to use the form that the hospital has. How many of you people have gone to the hospital and they hand you a form from the hospital? You know, it happens a lot, right? You should have your own form because you'd want to make a custom one. You know, you go to a car dealer and they sell you a car somebody else made. When you make yours, you get to decide it. A lawyer will give you the basic format, but you fill it in the way you want it, all right? Let me give you some examples of what could possibly be in your health care directive. You need to choose a person that you trust to be your health care preserved person. If you have two kids, name both of them, and they can act alternatively or together. And you can put the language in there. Or if you have three kids, do it. Three kids could be difficult. If somebody lives out of town and it's a long ways for them to go, could be difficult, but they can consult over the phone too. The other thing is you need to look at what person will follow your, what you want, okay? What is typically, with no directions, what does a Catholic want? A Catholic wants all the care necessary to keep them alive, all the reasonable care, uh, and all of the care that could be considered extraordinary, which will keep them alive, but at the same time is not futile or will do something that they're... And, and I like to say in the documents that you should be provided with nutrition and uh, hydration, water and food, okay? I think it's important to include that. Now, let's talk about what happens when a person like my brother-in-law cannot receive the food. My brother-in-law was dying, he was up in Napa, we went up to see him, and he couldn't take the nutrition anymore, his stomach w was not working. He couldn't, he couldn't receive the food and, and spread it and, and work it through his body. His organs had broken down. Okay, fine. I mean, he's, you can't force anybody, we don't want to do that. We don't want to just say, you know, give him the food even though he can't take it. Of course not, that, that's, that's cruel. So, so that didn't happen and he died by the next morning. But at the same time, people that are able to receive it, you should provide them with nutrition and you should provide them with hydration, the food and water. I mean, my goodness, you know, that's part of the nature of, of living. But we're living in a culture that doesn't think that's very important. You understand that? It, it, we're living in a culture that looks at that as not so important. So you gotta be strong on your feelings. And that's why if you write it in a healthcare directive, if you say, I want all the reasonable means necessary to keep me care, I want to, the best care possible, I allow my agent to reject care, which is too extraordinary, not helpful, not useful to me, but at the same time, I do ask that so long as I'm able to receive hydration and nutrition, that I be given that, okay? Something like that, that you include that. So, and you go over with your, with your healthcare person what you feel about this end of life decision, what you feel about it, you want the best, and at the same time, if it's gonna do, if they wanna have a, an operation on you that has very little chance of success, or not much chance of success, it would, I mean, you could easily reject that, or your, or your, your agent could reject that sort of thing. What you really want, and you should say that in, is you want a priest to come to you and anoint you. And you want to see communion if you can, and you want to have solace. I have found people that I've visited over the years, what they really want is not people in the room just talking, talking to them and talking to themselves, but people in the room praying.
praying for their soul. There's a big battle going on when people are dying for the soul of the person that's, that's ill, a big battle. And you people in this room know that. You know that from your personal experiences with your family members, your grandparents. You folks know that. That's why I agreed to come and talk to you, because I felt I could convince you, <laughs> because you already know the truth anyway. I'm just giving you new and up updated ideas. So that document of the, of the health care uh, uh, proxy is very important that you have that. I think you should have that. Because there are other documents, like the Pulse, that is a P-O-L-S-T. That is basically a document where you authorize the doctor to make decisions for you when you're unconscious, unable to make them. Do you really want to do that? I mean, there are doctors that you could trust, but a lot of them, I, I'm not so sure about that. You know, it's, it's, a, it's really the mentality that you're dealing with, in my judgment. What mentality are you dealing with? Do they have your best interests? Are they family? Are they blood? Are they from the same island, you know, the same place? So those are things to consider. Another document that you should definitely have is a health care for finances. So a power of attorney for health care. So those are the things that makes decisions about your health care when you're in the hospital, unable to make decisions. That document basically springs into effect when you're unconscious or unable to make the decisions. Does everybody understand that, okay? So it's not effective until you're unable to make decisions. There's another document that's similar to that called health care for finances. This is about the money. This is about the accounts, okay? This is about who's paying the bills when she's in the hospital. Who's taking care of the gardener? Who's paying the electricity bill? Somebody should be in charge of that. A will is not sufficient to give that power. You should have a health care, I mean, a power of attorney for finances to make that decision. And somebody would have that, it would spring into effect. That's typically the way it does. You have this power, if I'm unable to make these decisions, it springs into effect. And usually the person you choose is a family member, somebody nearby, somebody who can make those decisions, somebody who's good with money. And one of the big rules with money in this type of a situation is, if it's not your money, you do not spend one dime of it unless it's on the person or for the person that is the actual owner of the money, okay? That is very important. You never put any money into your account, you know? So you suddenly have the authority to sign the money at the bank. Oh, okay, you get to find out how much money they have in the account. Maybe you don't know. Now you look, oh, she has 100000 in there, right? Okay, you cannot take one dime from that and put it in your account or to pay your bills. And you go, I'm running to the bank. I go to the hospital all the time. I go to the hospital five times a week. Don't I get a little bit? No, you don't get any. Maybe, I mean, this is hard for people to understand. And this leads people into temptation to take a little bit because they are doing things. They are doing things. So if you think you might have that type of a situation, you can always write something in the document that says, I hereby authorize my attorney to be paid $20 an hour for services rendered on my behalf and approved by my, by my sister, the aunt. Let the aunt decide, right? So, okay, so these, this is an alternative I'm telling you about, all right? So this is, uh, these are common problems. And they, they creep up. And so I want to talk to that, but I also want to talk now a little bit about palliative care, all right? Palliative care when somebody is uh, not doing well, they're in a rest home, or they're, they're maybe even in, uh, the, in the, the care where the angels are not far away. You know, they're, they're really going to be uh, dying, and they could die within a couple of weeks or so. Okay, this is a great opportunity to be a saint. Yes. <clears throat> this is a great opportunity to be a saint. Yes. Okay? I mean, seriously, this is an opportunity for the church to shine. Each and every one of you are representatives of the church. You really are. And this is your great opportunity to shine, to be a person of service, somebody who goes over and visits the sick, who brings a little food with them, right? Or goes over to clean the house, or goes over to trim up the garden to take care of it, 
who goes over just to bring the nourishment and to be together. There's nothing like it when somebody's dying, the death marches on or the death watches on and the family comes together to pray, to say hello to one another, see friends again, reunion, and to be of service to the people. This is the, this is the key to love, the key to all the church's sacraments. Every sacrament the church has, the key to it is charity. 